I don't want to waste a lot of time talking about how incredible it is to have you all here. I've already said that a bunch of times, but this is one of the greatest honors of my life is to welcome uh, this, to be a part of this, to have uh, been able to spend this time with you so far. And, and it, is, it is incredibly joyful. And that's what you came here to do, uh, at least to celebrate, celebrate something, right? Shavuot, of course. And we're celebrating Shabbat. And that, that actually sort of raised some questions as I was reading through the mock sur that I have. Uh, I thought about this, and I'm going to be controversial here because that's what I like to do. But controversial in the sense of going against mainstream Judaism, all of Judaism, for a long, long time, and ask some questions. A question, really. But according to Judaism, what are we celebrating on Shavuot? The giving of the Torah. There's absolutely no question, right? That's what, that's what we're doing. Zaman Matan Torotenu, the time of the giving of our Torah. Now, there's one easy question that I would ask. The easy question is, where do we find the commandment for Shavuot in the Bible? In the Torah. It's in Leviticus 23, it's in Deuteronomy 16 as well. Where do we find in the Torah the commandment to celebrate the giving of the Torah on Shavuot? Okay. Where do we find the explicit instruction on which day to celebrate Shavuot? Well, we have the 50-day thing. Don't worry, I'm not going back down that road. <laughs> Game Omer, right? <laughs> By the way, Nick told me, and I can't believe I missed this opportunity, Thursday night my, my sign-off should have been, Rabbi Damien, Omer and out. <laughs> anyway, we, we know we have the 50-day thing. We certainly discussed that a lot, and I, I, we're not going back there. But let me say this, in the days before the calendars was set, Technically, we don't find that in the Torah either. We don't find, we know we start on the 16th of Nisan, but uh, explaining this to you, the length of months back then could vary. How was the month, how was the, the time of the month designated? By a witness, right? When you saw the moon. So if you start counting on the 16th, and it's a 30-day month and a 29-day month, or what if it's two 30-day months? That means Shavuot could fall on the 5th of Sivan, the 6th of Sivan. There's arguments in the Talmud about it falling on the, it should be celebrated on the 7th of Sivan. So the Torah doesn't give us the specific date for Torah. And that's a little bit tricky if we're going to tie a specific date to a specific historical event, which was the giving of the Torah. But speaking of the historical event, you've already answered the question, where do we find the explicit reason for the holiday of Shavuot? The answer is, in the plain sense, explicit instruction for connecting Shavuot to the Torah on the 6th of Sivan is in nowhere. It's not in there. Okay. The Torah does not make that connection for us specifically. It's found in the Talmud. You can start in Pesachim 68b. It's in Jewish tradition. It's been around a long time. But scripturally speaking, Zaman Matan Torotenu should be Ein Lanu et HaTorah. We do not have the Torah. There, anyway. Spelled out. Now, celebrating Shavuot is a commandment. On this second day of Shavuot, we need to investigate this. Why are we celebrating the giving of the Torah if it's not explicitly spelled out in there? Is that a challenge for anyone? I know it is for all those people who talk about man made traditions. I know it's a problem. But you'd want to know. I mean, if someone asked, and said, show me where that is in your Torah that you follow, that you celebrate this. You'd want to know, right? So I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to give you your money's worth today. I'm going to give you two messages in one. 
So how many of you, if you ever listen to my recordings, play them back on 2x speed? <laughs> I do that for you on purpose. I talk this slow so that you can play them back on 2x speed. <laughs> I'm really asking a question that you may have never asked. Why are we celebrating what we're celebrating if it's not explicitly spelled out in there? We assume this, but what do we have about Shavuot? What do we know? If there's no Torah celebration commandment and we can't literally tie it to the historical event of giving the Torah, what are we doing? Well, we know we have three things for Shavuot, three names, Hag HaKatsir, the Harvest Festival, Hag HaShavuot, the Festival of Weeks, counting from barley to wheat. We have Hag HaBikorim, first fruits. What do those things have in common? They're agricultural. That's what we know. We know something. Shavuot is an agricultural festival, but let me tell you something, that's not that special. That's not that special in the ancient Near East. Everyone had harvest festivals. It wasn't unique. But Pesach, well, Pesach and Sukkot are also harvest festivals, right? And so, well, Pesach is commemorating spring and green and new life, and Sukkot is, is the festival of ingathering, this, this harvest thing. But both of those had a definite historical dimension, didn't they? They had a definite thing that happened. Passover, we know, of course, most clearly celebrates, yes, the spring, the newness of life, but it celebrates the going out of slavery, 14th, 15th of the month of Nisan. Sukkot is a fall harvest, but it also commemorates a very particular event. Starting on the 15th, on the seventh month, you shall live in booths for seven days, it tells us there in Leviticus. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generation may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You have a date, you have a historical connection. Sukkot, Passover. Any argument? No, couldn't. There's not one. But something's missing here. Those festivals, Pesach and Sukkot and Shavuot are called Shalosh Regalim. Those are the three big pilgrimage festivals, okay? The first two have something really cool going on that's spelled out right there in the Torah. Where is the festival that commemorates the culmination of the thing? We talk about going out of Egypt. We talk about being camped in the wilderness. Where is the, where is the festival that says, hey, we finally arrived. The pilgrimage actually ended we made it to Israel. Where is that festival? Do you know where it is in the Torah? Well, it just might be that Shavuot, this one unique last pilgrimage festival with its agricultural element, it has to have some bigger meaning. And if the Torah doesn't explicitly connect it to the giving of the Torah, then what if there's something else, this connection of the omer, the eating of the grain in the land? It would seem that it is definitely tied to something, a promise, a fulfillment of God's word to make the land a reality. You tracking with me so far? That Shavuot's historical connection, though unspoken, is the land. We finally have a land where we can be free. We talked about that on Thursday night, that God is a promise keeper. What was God's big promise in the Torah? To Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, it was to the people in Exodus in Egypt. Chapter 6, what was the promise? The land. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I'm the Lord, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name I did not make known to them, and established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, in which they lived as strangers. Exodus 6, 8, he says to the, Israel, to the, to the Hebrews, I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. So if there's one thing in the Torah that seems clear about Shavuot, 
It's that it's a third pilgrimage festival that completes the cycle. We go from Egypt to the desert to the land. That it's the culmination. Even our symbols, even the symbols that we have for Shavuot, what is one? Dairy. Why do we do that? Because it will be a land flowing with milk and honey, foliage and, and beautiful flowers. Why do we do that? Well, we've been told it's because the Mount Sinai bloomed, but it's a sign of prosperity and a land that blooms and blossoms, right? Even the symbols suggest it. And, and looking at, we talked about bread and bread of freedom. You, you, you see these three breads on the pilgrimage festivals. The bread of affliction, the bread from heaven, and the bread of freedom on Shavuot. There's this beautiful land thing. So that actually seems much more plausible than the giving of the Torah, which is said nowhere. And it is conceivable that early in Israel's history, that's exactly what Shavuot was. An agricultural festival of the harvest of the goodness of God and his incredible goodness to make right on his promise and the covenant to give us our land. But there's a problem with this theory. Anyone identify a problem with this theory? Something terrible happened. We lost the land. We lost the land. These festivals are eternal. Shavuot gets this designation. It's to be a permanent statute in your dwelling places throughout. If the holiday is supposed to be about the land and we lost our land, even though it looks like that's what it could be about, that's a problem. What would we be celebrating? And it makes us pause to consider, if there's no land, how would we thank God for a harvest or a freedom? And there's a unique consideration in Israel's history that's revealed right here. Something unique about Israel versus everybody else. And maybe not everybody, but they're probably the best picture of it. You ready for this? Most civilizations begin with a land. Someone settles somewhere, right? There a group becomes a clan. They plant, they develop, they, they develop systems of support for the people. They eventually build villages and they farm and, and eventually a nation is born. And then what happens when a nation is born? A system of law is developed, which governs the nation. Land, then law. Israel is the opposite. Israel is the opposite. The law came first. It had to. Because it was the foundation, the covenant that would become the foundation, as Israel developed as a nation undergirded by this law, this would be the nation, I mean, this would be the law, the foundation, that as they went into the land, they would become a light to the world, which was the calling. Okay? It was sealed with covenant at Sinai. We will hear, we will obey, we will do all that you have said, taking the law when we come into the land that we don't even have yet that you said you'd give us. And so we see with Hashem and Israel, in order to celebrate the land, to live happy and healthy lives, thriving with freedom and liberty for all, you must first celebrate the law. The law. It's such a, such a name. Celebrate that God made a covenant with your people, but more than that, Israel learned something through the loss of the land. What did they learn? That you can lose a land, but God's connection to them through this covenant the covenant that came before could not be broken. That is exactly what he said to them in Leviticus 26. He said, 
in spite of this, after he's gone through the long list of horrendous curses, he says, in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so loathe them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God, but I will remember them for the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. These are the statutes and ordinances and laws which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel. God already knew they'd lose the land, obviously, but he said, I'll never turn my back on you because of this law, this covenant this arrangement we have. And so we see a fantastic reality. It was not the land that made God's people Israel, but the law and the great gift of God was the covenant and the law, the ketubah actually, much more loving language, the marriage document. And that's what the prophets said over and over. They repeated it. He won't forget you. Return to him. He'll return to you. But come back to the covenant first. And in Babylon, after they had been out of their land in exile, they discovered it. There they discovered it. We are the people of the book, of the covenant, before we are the people of the land. In exile, no land, out of the land, but still under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, they made a connection and they started a movement. They would return to the land again, but it would be this time with this very, very firm connection to the Torah. All of the people understood that. They returned to the covenant. They read in Nehemiah 6, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating in the sense so that they understood the meaning. And not long after that, in Nehemiah, once again, what do they do? They rededicate themselves to the covenant because they learn that the land can be lost without the law. And yet again, despite the call to remove division, sinat hinam, baseless hatred, ignoring the pleas of Yeshua to repent, it happened again. You see, Ezra and Nehemiah said, it's, this is the Torah, this is the law that God has given. It's instruction for right living. It'll bring blessing in the land. We must have the former for the latter. And for 500 years something, that worked pretty well. And then all of a sudden it was falling apart again and Yeshua said, no, no, no. Come back to what? Repent, come back to the instruction of God. Love people, love each other. But it was ignored, and the land was lost again, another exile. But a miracle took place in that some of the wisest people to ever live who have done something incredible, the sages recognized and kept the nation alive through the gift of Mount Sinai, through the Torah. Once again, apart from the land, they made this, the, the Torah the most important part of Jewish life. And people ask, why do you always talk about the Torah, the Torah, the Torah? Because it has maintained, while so many other cultures have been eradicated from the face of the earth, these men and women certainly, even though we don't read about them a lot, built and maintained something that was basically invisible. The land is tangible, but yet this covenant is invisible. And they held it. And to make it very clear, the gift for Israel was to create with this gift they got a society of justice and compassion. Rabbi Sachs says, when they lost the land, but they knew they still had the Torah, that is when Jews fully realized that this is what Shavuot had been about from the beginning. It was those scholars, actually, to answer our first question, and I told you it's nowhere in the Torah. It was those scholars who saw in Shavuot the gift of the Torah as the true celebration of the holiday. And what happened that day? It was them who spoke of the holiday as Zaman Matan Torotena. And they realized, this is it. 
First of all, though, there's someone says, here we go again, those doggone rabbis, <laughs> making things up. I want more proof. Okay, I'll give you some. First off, the Torah focuses quite a lot on the Torah, right? <laughs> the journey to Sinai, the giving of the Torah, the commandments. Israel spent less than a year at Mount Sinai, but the Torah, uh, it spends a third of the scroll dedicated to the story of getting the Torah and then reading it and understanding it and all this. It, it takes up a pretty big part of the Torah. So if Sukkot and the minor event of dwelling in Sukkot for wilderness, if that gets a seven-day festival, where does a third of the Torah scroll get its festival? Not to mention, it would have been very surprising if there's no remembrance or memorial given to the Sinai event. And so we build on that idea and know that Mount, when Sinai occurred in the third month, we can read that in Exodus 19. There's only one festival that occurs in the third month. What is it? You're, you're, you're in it. You're celebrating it. This is the third month. Welcome to Shavuot with Shalom in the third month. This is the festival, okay? And there's, uh, there, but, but this, is, this is the really cool stuff. Stay with me, wake up, tune in, listen for this. This is, this is the, what you need to hear. There's a tremendous connection in the apocryphal book of Jubilees. Anyone know what Jubilees is? It was written in the middle of the second century, probably by a priest. It's not part of the Tanakh. It is not canonized. But given the time period in which it was written, we gain some very valuable insights about teachings and traditions from the period. It tells biblical history in its own unique way, in 50-year cycles of biblical history. What's a 50-year cycle? A jubilee. Hey, we're getting it. Book of Jubilees, Yovil, right? But there's some, obviously, in, in most of these types of writings, there's some pretty fanciful stuff. I mean, at least very different than what we're used to. But Jubilees tells us something incredible that I want you to learn about Shavuot. In chapter 6, it says this, And he gave to Noah and his sons a sign that there should not again be a deluge over the earth. He placed his bow in the clouds as a sign of the eternal covenant that no water of the deluge should ever again come over the earth to destroy it on the days of the earth. Okay, what is that? That's the covenant with Noah. That's the covenant to never flood the earth, right? In verse 15, 615 in Jubilees, it says, On this account it is ordained and written on the tablets of heaven that the celebration of the festival of weeks should be in this month once a year for a renewed covenant in each year after year. Do you understand that? The book of Jubilees is saying the covenant of Noah was on Shavuot. Then in Jubilees, in 1420, Abraham enters the story. On that day, we made a covenant with Abram according to the covenant which he had made in this month with Noah. And Abraham renewed the festival and ordinance for himself unto eternity. Do you understand that? The Abrahamic covenant, it says, was sealed on Shavuot. This is tradition recorded in Jubilees, but it's an amazing connector to what we're talking about, that despite the Torah's silence on Shavuot's connection to it, the covenant at Sinai, Shavuot had already been a day associated with covenant since Noah and Abraham. And so logically for Israel, it was Shavuot is the covenant day. Okay, Yom Brit, it's the covenant day for Noah. He, Noah, in the sense of modern humanity, everybody is descended from Noah. Noah and his covenant represented the world. And then comes along Abraham, and Abraham represented a, a family and his covenant. And then Moses and Israel representing a nation and their covenant 
on Shavuot. But here's my favorite part. Because the question, of course, we know, I'm, I'm telling you this from the Jubilees, and we're talking about the, the rabbis making up holidays. Well, did the Talmudic rabbis make this up? Zaman matan torotenu? I mean, should we be celebrating the harvest? Should we be thanking God for the land? Or did they, they, they find something? Well, there's another covenant, isn't there? There's actually two. There's one called the Davidic covenant, but there's another big one. It's like a new thing. God's doing a new thing. You know what it is? Of course you do. There's another covenant. And what is at the center of this new covenant? Israel is there, and what is the lifeblood of Israel? The Torah. I want to refresh you on the new covenant here. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord, and they will return from the land of the enemy. This is Jeremiah 31, the most famous new covenant text we have. They will return from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children will return to their territory. Number one, inheriting the land. Two, they will come and shout for joy on the height of Zion, and they will be radiant over the bounty of the Lord, over the grain, the new wine, the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. So two, we have something about the harvest of the land. We have returning to the land. We have the harvest of the land. And three, for this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their heart. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Most importantly, we find something about the Torah. And man, that sounds a lot like Shavuot. When we have the return to the land, the harvest, and the Torah. Ezekiel 36 for future, uh, future, no, further confirmation. And I will put my spirit within you and bring it about that you walk in my statutes and you'll follow my ordinances and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers so you will be my people and I will be your God. That's another very, very famous new covenant text, Right? Now, allow me to read a little bit of other New Covenant language. I'm almost on the last page. Luke 22:20. 20. We heard about this thing called the New Covenant. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the New Covenant in my blood. That New Covenant that we're talking about was sealed on a particular day, was it not? It's not fully realized, but it has been inaugurated and sealed. First of all, what sealed the new covenant? What is the sign of the new covenant? Second Corinthians, now he who established us with you in Messiah and anointed us in God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. The spirit is the sign of the new covenant. Now, and this is not a trick question, when was that spirit given? Shavuot. When the day of Pentecost had come, Shavuot, they were all together in one place, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you see? Do you see what I see? <laughs> Listen to this. The greatest evidence for the giving of the Torah on Shavuot is not found in the Talmud or even in the Torah, but actually in the book of Acts by the work of our Messiah. Amen, brothers and sisters. Messianic Judaism, go. <laughs> One for us, finally. The giving of the Spirit, it's the sign of the one sealed to participate in the new covenant. Shavuot is what day? 
Covenant day. What does the Spirit do for us? It teaches you Torah. It guides you. It reminds you of the words of our Messiah, which are what? Torah. He taught you Torah. It witnesses and writes the Torah on our hearts in preparation. And this is the best part for our entry into the promised land, the kingdom, the world to come. And I've got 50 different pieces spinning here, so I'm going to bring them all together. I hope you've drawn your own conclusions. I've tried to make it easy enough for you to do that. Wait, that sounded like I thought you were dumb. I don't think you're dumb. I know you're following me. I tried to communicate in a way where all these pieces could come together in the end, and this is where that's going to happen. On which day was the Torah given according to the rabbis? Shavuot. And on which day did Hashem fill the disciples and all who were there with this Torah-teaching, covenant-sealing sign? Shavuot. And think of this with me, just as I told you. The law preceded the land for Israel. That law was given that they might be a light to the nations to serve God, to love God, to love each other in the land. So, too, none of us are in the land. The promised land, the world to come, but we have received in some sense a taste of the law written on our hearts. And though we may be far from the kingdom, we're, we're living in exile, as it were. The promise remains. That seal and that promise cannot be taken from you no matter what happens, no matter what land you're in, where you are, what you're doing. That is yours. It identifies you, it marks you, it seals you for the future and for the land that one day you will inherit. Of all the days, if we can believe the book of Jubilees and the Acts of the Apostles, this story says that maybe we should remember on Shavuot, the covenant holiday, Noah, Abraham, Moses and Israel, Yeshua, and us. This is the day. Actually, it was yesterday, but this is the second day of Shavuot. (laughs) So this is it. With confidence, I can tell you today. As I told you Thursday night, I'm all the more convinced as... We have celebrated Shavuot on the right day for the right reasons, and and all of the reasons, the land, the harvest, the, the Torah, and the Spirit are all included in the miracle that took place on Mount Sinai and in Jerusalem on Shavuot. This is indeed the day to celebrate, not only the giving of the Torah and the covenant at Sinai, but the giving of the Spirit and the promise of what is to come. Hag Shavuot Sameach. Shabbat Shalom.